Welcome back to the Lightbulb series by Valkyrie Investments, where we cover crypto topics requested by you in five minutes or less. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Amit, and I'm the president of Zillica and also one of the co-founders of Zillica. We had about seven to eight co-founders back then. And all of them, I would say most of them, had scientific experience. So most of them had PhD or were postdoc or faculty members at universities. And um, you know, because of that background, we were obviously looking into Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and you know, general blockchain space. And it was it was about 2017. So we had seen CryptoKitties happen. We had seen uh, some of the ICOs happen. And every time an ICO happened on Ethereum, basically the network was clogged for for quite a bit of time. So we quickly realized that the scalability problem is indeed going to go come and become big very soon. So. The idea was to figure out a way in which we could solve the scalability problem for public blockchains. So back then I was a postdoc researcher, a postdoctoral researcher at the National University of Singapore. And my advisor was Pratik Saxena, who's also one of the co-founders of Zilliqa. And he had published a paper on sharding, basically a simple way to divide and conquer. So you divide the network into smaller groups and you use that smaller group to scale, basically. So that the more smaller groups you have, the more transactions you can process. So he had published this paper in one of the best uh, I would say security conferences in, in, um, in the world. And uh, together with the CEO of Kyber Network, so Loy Lu, who was back then a PhD student uh, in, in the lab where I was working as postdoc. Mm. So, um, so we had this paper, an academic one, very theoretical one. And the idea was, can we commercialize this in some meaningful way? And so we assembled a team together, which was me, Pratik, some of the other folks, and we decided to basically implement that into a practical software system. And that eventually became Zilliqa. So that's kind of a little bit of story behind, behind what Zilliqa is and where we started. And so firstly, thank you. And then when you guys were, when you guys were thinking about scalability solutions, essentially for Zilliqa, how did you come, how did you decide on sharding versus some of the other scalability solutions that we're seeing other layer ones put into place? Yeah, so for example, back then there was uh, EOS that had uh, you know, launched or about to launch. And there were not too many other solutions. Mostly there were solutions around L2. So mm-hmm. um, you know, Raiden was there, or at least was about to go. And um, almost other, all the other chains were mostly around privacy back then. Mm-hmm. And most of the other projects were around applications. So DEXs, you know, uh, lending protocols, and those sort of things back then. And so we realized that, you know, there are two ways in which you can scale. One is somehow, you know, limit your network size to a smaller sort of subset. So you could go the style the way EOS went, or you could go the newer style, which is I think probably 10, 15 nodes or something around that, 20 nodes, I guess. Um, Or you could try to stay with a larger network size, which could be let's say 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and yet be able to sort of benefit from the scalability of a large network. So we decided to make sure that we did not want to de- you know, sort of sacrifice decentralization at any cost. And therefore the obvious solution was sharding. And uh, because uh, you know, Pratik and my advisor had already written that paper, we already had that groundwork done already. So we had the base to start from. And that's how you know, there was no other choice other than, other than sharding to go with. It makes perfect sense. And then when you, when, when y'all thought about, so obviously when, in the earlier days and, and even now, right, when ICOs would come out on Ethereum and the entire network would be clogged. And obviously now we're seeing that times a thousand because of gas fees and other things are terrible. Um, when, when you guys were thinking about the need for scalability within a truly decentralized blockchain, what were some of the primary, and you said, you know, most blockchains back then were focused on privacy predominantly. What use case were you guys envisioning that you thought would kind of be the, you know, the first use case to come out on Zillica. So I would say that our focus, to be honest with you, was very much on the uh, you know building the platform side. But very soon after, we realized that there were a couple of projects, interesting projects that came up uh, that developed uh, on Zillica. One was Unstoppable Domains, which was uh, mm-hmm. funded by you know, Draper uh, Associates and, and, and so on. And the idea was to basically build a domain name system backed by blockchain. So um, mm-hmm. for example, instead of having to Let's say send money to 0x1b, a hexadecimal address, you would want to send it to, let's say, James dot something. Mm-hmm. And you will have a contract that basically translates your name to the actual address that you own. We obviously had back then, we realized that you know, blockchains are complex. You know, uh, today, 
when you use any DApp today, whether it, whether it be DeFi or NFT to, to less extent, but if you look at any DeFi today, it really screams blockchain, right? Mm. You, know, you have to install a MetaMask wallet, you have to understand how to get it, you know, hold of Ether, then you have to understand how to interact with, let's say, Uniswap V3 and V2, for example, it, it's, it's quite difficult. So, you know, even though we didn't have a concrete application in mind, we, we knew that, you know, you know, blockchain applications that will be successful will only be those that are closer to user, you know, mm-hmm. easier to understand. And sad reality is, you know, DeFi's, DeFi projects are becoming more and more complex every single day to a point where an average user has to literally watch a one hour video to be able to understand how to play around with it, which is not really the goal, should not be the goal of, you know, you know technology like, like blockchains. Again, it's early stages, you know, it's early days, you know, blockchains are only about 10 years old now. You know, it's, it's, it's going to take some time, but I think the idea is to be able to build applications that um, when you use them, you don't realize that there's a backend, which is mm. you know, powered by blockchains. Yeah. Uh, it's like, for example, when you use, let's say you install any app today from your app store, you don't have to watch, uh, you, know, you don't have to go to YouTube and understand how to use that app before you actually start using it. It's so obvious, the user experience is so obvious that you don't need lessons. And I think we have to, you know, it will take a bit of time for us, I think entire industry, but we'll get to a point where blockchains will become so seamless that you won't even realize that it's actually being run by a backend blockchain. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I also agree with you in terms of what we need over the next few years to actually encourage adoption and also development on blockchain. Um, a, a slight aside, I was helping, I was explaining, my brother's a big gamer. To him weekend, I was like, have you heard of Axie Infinity? Have you heard of, you know, Yield Guild Games, all of this kind of play to, er, play to earn model? And he's like, no, I haven't. And I was like, well, instead of, you know, paying money to somebody to play the games that you love, why don't you try playing a game that pays you for once? Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was one of those classic things where he's like, okay, well, how do I, how do I set up my MetaMask wallet? How do I set up my, um, I don't remember what, what they call it, a Ronin wallet for Axie Infinity. So it's like, what's this, what's this bridging? Why is it ETH versus WEATH? And it was just, you know, it's just a super long, the super long thing. And it would just, it reminded me of what it's like to try to get somebody else into these things where they're like, I just want to, I just want to play essentially Tamagotchi on my computer. And I'm like, well, we have four hours of work to do and the debit card transaction on wire via MetaMask to get you WEATH to begin with before we can actually start playing. I mean, the incentives definitely help you and, you know, basically push you to, even though there's a lot yeah. of friction, yeah. it does help you out. But eventually, uh, you know, we need to be able to figure out a uh, better user experience for end users. And the fact is, you know, until let's say even six months ago, every blockchain platform was talking only about developers. Again, I'm not saying yeah. that they are, we should not. We, we definitely have to attract developers who can build applications that others can use. But in the end, there's also, you know, and I, I hate to say this, but even though I'm a developer, I hate to say this, I feel that most of the applications that have been built so far are built by developers for developers, you know? Mm, yeah. And so, and that has to change. And it's changing now. People in the last, I would say three months or so, people are talking more about users. You know, people talking about, okay, now gas fees are high and so on. People are really talking about user experience, yeah. which wasn't quite the case, I would say six months ago. You know, it was yeah, all it, about, it was- oh, I think you're right too. And I mean, in the earlier days too, even smart contract deployment was, or or sorry, gas fees were typically talked about in terms of smart contract deployment, not necessarily smart contract interaction for the retail public. Indeed, indeed. It was literally, I think uh, during the DeFi summer, the narrative was that, oh, I have to deploy a multi-sig wallet and it cost me $5,000, right? Mm -hmm. So if you you think about it, that's that's a very developer perspective to it. Again, nothing wrong with it, but you are also ignoring the fact that there are users who you want to attract them towards your platform, towards your applications and services so that they can use it. And that requires yeah. transactions. And I think it's changing. I totally agree. But again, it will, take, it will take a bit more time for us to understand and the technology to mature that uh, to a point where people, any, you know, an average Joe user can go and use it. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And and to, to to kind of pivot a teeny bit to how you guys dealt with this, this problem, right? Of like, of generating adoption. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys have the the one of the only, if not the only, programming language that essentially guides developers towards safer smart contract deployment. Is that an accurate way to describe Zilla? Yeah. So uh, you know, when we were designing Zilliqa, of course, the one point that we that was a pain point for everyone was scalability. So we want to make sure that you know developers and users have an easy way to transact uh, without worrying too much about the underlying capacity of the network. 
And the second thing that we had noticed was, uh, you know, the DAO hacks, the parity mm -hmm. hack, the every other day DeFi hack that you that you see in the Ethereum space. Again, I understand there's a lot of experimentation being done, and you know, when you do experiments, you know, things will backfire or things will fire in the wrong direction, which is fine. But we also felt that the way the language was designed, the, you know, I mean, Solidity. It was yeah. not designed with safety in mind. Mm -hmm. It was not designed, or maybe it was designed at a point when Vitalik and the team didn't realize that these contracts are going to handle billions of dollars worth of assets. And today, every single contract, you launch a contract today, and overnight, you know, it, it has a TVL about a billion dollars, right? <laughs> to a point where- Yeah, that, that's, mi that's, minimum. that's exactly, minimum. Exactly, exactly. Maybe because you're printing all sorts of, uh, you know, magic internet money. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. I think it's, it's also money in some way. And people, and we realized that, you know, it would be important for us to design something, design a language in which people could write contracts and just to give some guarantee that, you know, your contract is safe to use, mm -hmm. right? And it also sort of, you know, if you think about it, right, it also pushes users out, right? Imagine, for example, you're a normal user, you have, let's say, $1,000, and you want to use the $1,000 to, I don't know, participate in Uniswap V2 or V3 or some lending products. And if you, every other day, you see on Twitter that, oh, this DeFi hack happened and $100 million worth of assets were stolen, or a billion dollars worth of assets were hacked and frozen, you lose confidence, right? You know, you, you, it pushes you back. Every DeFi hack, while it makes the ecosystem stronger, it does push users a little bit you know, behind and says, okay, yeah. you know what? It's not ready for you. Uh, you know, you should not put your money right away right now. So that was kind of the rational behind uh, sort of designing a safer language for people to use and people to build in. And that's how Sila came about. So it's yeah. designed in a way that it somewhat restricts a few things around solidity and that makes it slightly more secure and easy to reason about. Gotcha. And that was going to be my next question is, do you, do you feel, I mean, my assumption is yes, obviously, because you guys created it, that you guys have struck, a, you know, an, an acceptable and also helpful balance between security and flexibility? Yeah, I would say so. For example, I would say, I'll give you an example of what you can't do in Scylla so that you get a sense of yeah. uh, the limitations of it. So one thing that you can't do in Scylla that you can do in Solidity is you can write infinite loops. So in Solidity, mm -hmm. you can write infinite loops. You can basically say, while true and do whatever you want. Yeah. Now, even though you can write this code, you actually can never run this code on, on, you know, on, the, on, the, on the network because the network runs with gas and you mm -hmm. can't run a contract that will never end, but right? it has to end. So um, even though you can write uh, sort of infinite for loops in Solidity, you can never run it in principle. So Scylla, what it does is it basically eliminates that. So you simply cannot write uh, an infinite for loop because anyway, you can't run it. So what's the point? So what it does is it introduces a structured way of sort of writing for loops. The other thing, for example, you can't do right now, which we are thinking right now, whether it introduces any risks or not, which is you can't spin up a new contract on the fly from a contract. So basically what happens in Solidity is that imagine you have a contract and this contract can basically deploy a new contract on the fly. Mm -hmm. There are some advantages to it, but there are also some risk security risks to it. And so initially we felt that it would be a good idea to basically stop it. Don't allow people mm -hmm. to deploy um, you know, a contract on the fly. Well, it doesn't limit you from anything, right? Because if you wanted to deploy, you could always deploy it you know, separately, right? Sure. So it doesn't, it doesn't limit you in any way, but it does give you some guarantees about safety of your contract. So these are kind of a couple of things that we changed in the language so that it becomes slightly more reassuring for users and developers. Interesting. No, I, I appreciate that. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's one, one thing that we, we hear a lot, or at least we say a lot, you know, when people will send headlines on a, on a given day, because, you know, 80, $80 million TVL hack um, or 110 or, you know, I mean, I hear 80 these days and I'm like, oh, that's it. Um, and my response, once I kind of, I took a moment and I stepped back and my response was, you know, it's a Tuesday in crypto, man. And I was like, that's pretty wild, right? That. You know, mm -hmm. essentially once a week, or let's be honest, far more than once a week, we're okay with just a few hundred million dollars just being hacked. Okay. It's just it's just something that you become accustomed to. And that's, that is a truly, truly wild concept, Indeed. right? And, and there's tons of stats, I'm sure you've seen them, uh, you know, a, about the number of dollars, so to speak, that go missing from like our fiat economy as well, which is also substantial. I'm not going to mess them up and pretend like I remember them, but I, I, that would be a really interesting point of comparison, right? It's like how much DeFi hack versus how many dollars just go missing. I wonder if they're, I wonder if they're commensurate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, no, I agree. It's a valid point as well of comparison. I know, but I also feel that there's, uh, I, I guess there's a bit of difference in the two models, I suppose. One is 
uh, in the DeFi model, I feel that sometimes we as developers are irresponsible as well. Again, mm. what, what I mean by this is sometimes what we do is because the whole thing, the DeFi space moves so fast that you need to come up with something really, really quick. Yeah. To a point where you launch something and basically over the weekend by forking different things and combining and you know mashing everything together and, and say, okay, here's a new product. And you put a disclaimer somewhere that it's in beta and whatnot and go and use it. And as a developer, we, I think we should take slightly more responsible approach to things. Again, sure, we can do experimentation, but I think it's still, you know, we know that, you know, no matter what we, no matter what disclaimer we put, we know that people are going to ape in, right? Mm -hmm. And when yeah. people are going to ape in, you know, you want to be slightly more responsible. So uh, I know that some projects, for example, we're very careful about their launches where they said, okay, we are going to cap our TVL to be, I don't know, $50 million for the first one month. We see how things go, and then we'll increase that cap to $100 million and so on and so forth. Yeah. Which, again, it's not everything, but at least it supports and prevents potential harm that may happen to potential end users. Yeah, I, I respect that approach. So then, Amrit, is it, is it safe to assume that you guys do not test in production? I would say, yes, we don't <laughs> test in production. Uh, <laughs> look, I mean, there, there, are two, there are two theories to it, right? One is... Um, sometimes you're forced to test in production. I understand that, yeah. right? You know, because uh, if you try to test in testnet environment, you may not have all that, you know, user base. You may not have all that, true. you know, composability that you can imagine. So it's, it's sometimes difficult. But again, it also means that we have to build more tools that allows developers to test in a better way, right? You know, yeah. you are, should not be forced to test in production. So our, our approach has been, you know, very minimal, minimalistic in that sense that we will, we will try to test as much as we can uh, in test environment. And if not, what we end up doing is we basically put up a test net and we incentivize community to actually go and play around with it. Yeah. And sometimes they find it, they find bugs, they report issues, whether it be UX or something else, and we fix them. And then yeah. we try to do a measured approach where we try to restrict, let's say some put some caps around this and then slowly lift that cap up. Yeah, no, that makes good sense. And then for, um, in terms of utilization on the Zilliqa blockchain right now, what what category of DAP would you say is being built, you know, most frequently right now on Zilliqa? And is that in line with what you guys expected and kind of what you built the blockchain for originally? I would say that, you know, a lot of, um, we obviously, you know, since DeFi summer, a lot of activity also went into DeFi. So we had stable coins coming up, we had bridges coming mm -hmm. up, we had DEXs coming up and, you know, a bunch of other things. But since uh, Facebook's uh, announcement, or even even before that, you know, Meta and everything else, I think there was obviously a wave of NFT uh, that came up on Zilliqa as well. Yeah, which was not everything was built by us. Actually, a lot of things was built by the community itself. So uh, people were launching all sorts of marketplaces where you could trade uh, your NFTs. Um, we are, uh, you know, partnering with a couple of esports companies as well. Mm. And the idea is to be able to launch a few interesting things because we felt that esports, like it or not, that crowd that follows esports is very close to, okay, one, it's very digitally native. You know, they are always yeah. on computers, they always play games. Yeah. And two is they're very close to crypto as well, which is all, also has the same kind of uh, profile, let's put that way. Yeah. So uh, we feel that that intersection point be, can be very interesting for crypto. So we are trying to uh, sort of partner with esports companies and see how we can better build better models of engagement with their fans and followers. Mm, I love that. Um, and and then in terms of, so I was going through y'all's website a little bit over the weekend, um, and I saw mention uh, multiple times about the, the the team's interest in security tokens and tokenization specifically, you know, in a regulated fashion, not an ICO. Um, when when I think about NFTs, right, like who you know who who doesn't love fun art, right? But the the current, and I, I realize that's a gross implication, but I'll run with it. <laughs> the current use cases of nfts in my mind are really only scratching the surface and when we get to the true beauty of the technology and we talk about things like security tokens or really anything that has you know a, a derivative stream or intellectual property associated with it um, that's when i start to get really excited as i'm sure you can tell right like that's where that technology can really change the world and change markets um, how do you guys think about NF the intersection of NFTs and security tokens or really just security tokens at all if the two don't have any overlap in y'all's mind? Yeah, so, you know, when we started, it was back in, a way in 2018, I would say, 2018, 2019. Uh, back then, ICOs were obviously dying and people had realized that, okay, this 
this one is over now. So let's uh, let me have a Yeah, I think I think your website says like they were on their way out, parenthetical for good reason, or something <laughs> like something like that. Indeed. So at, at that point, we realized that there has to be slightly more structured way of doing things. And also as an extension of ICO, you could actually, you know, tokenize almost anything in the world. And mm -hmm. right now you're seeing that yeah. happen. You're seeing NFTs tokenizing, you know, digital and physical artwork. You're seeing, uh, you know, fungible tokens tokenizing communities, right? You know, fan yeah. tokens and social tokens are basically tokenizing communities in some way. And the idea was to go even beyond and see if you can convert sort of real world assets into tokens as well. So, um, you know, we've, you know, we felt that, for example, real estate, you can imagine ha having or owning an apartment in New York City and wanting to sell a half or one third of that apartment to someone else. And that you could do using NFT. So you could have your entire apartment structured as an NFT and you could sell them or you could fractionalize them and sell mm -hmm. a portion of that apartment. So you're not basically dividing your room, but you're fractionalizing the the the, the asset that you're holding. Yeah, yeah, the ownership, the ownership and or the revenues. Exactly. And you could, for example, take half of your building or your apartment and take a loan against that. And you could use mm -hmm. that as a collateral. And a bunch of these, these, these things are actually being built today in the, in the DeFi space itself. And the idea is, can we extend that into more real worlds, you know, using more real world assets? So for example, um, EdgeX, which is the exchange that uh, we have been working with, mm. uh, EdgeX as in Mercury, EdgeX, um, because it's fluid, you know, mm. it's the only liquid in some way, uh, liquid metal. So uh, anyway, so it got its license, um, uh, I think last year, where the idea was to be able to basically tokenize sort of real world assets. So they did um, a tokenization of uh, whiskey uh, some time back. So what you do is you have these barrels and casks of whiskey. You don't buy the whole cask, but you're basically tokenizing that and fractionalizing it. So you're basically buying a bottle of a cask mm. and that bottle has not been bottled yet. So, that way. so um, uh, and they are sort of extending it and planning to extend it to you know, all sorts of artwork, like let's say Picasso's painting and whatnot. So, um, you know, uh, there's, there's a seriousness there. And I think at some point, again, it's, the adoption is slow, but I think at some point you will see you know, real world assets, buildings, apartments and whatnot uh, being tokenized and being used and accepted by traditional financial institutions as, as assets. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I totally agree with you. I was in, um, I was at the Vertalo Digital Asset Summit um, in Austin a couple months ago and I think, and I'll, I'll botch this number a little bit, but essentially they were saying that about 70% of the securitizations running through their platforms are entirely real estate based. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, and it was, you know, it was not a conference about real estate, but it was a conference about a whole lot of real estate, um, which was which was wonderful to see, right? I mean, like there were a bunch of very, very large developers, commercial, you know, commercial property management firms, REITs, et cetera, all of whom were looking at, you know, ways to securitize either new offerings or even existing offerings just to get either you know, off the streams or get liquidity for those who have been locked up with no liquidity for, you know, a decade or so. Yeah, exactly. As you mentioned, you know, REITs, I mean, we have been talking to REITs back then and uh, the idea was very similar, which is, can we make this market more liquid? You know, yeah. it could also be extended to, let's say, your uh, private equities. So today, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to buy, let's say, early, you know, SpaceX, let's say, shares, you know, you would want that liquidity to be to be available to for people to participate in. And I think, you know, um, a, a, a sort of a you know, a market that allows people to tokenize private equities would be would be very handy. And SGX was the idea behind that was to be able to bring private equities into so make, basically making private equities liquid for yeah. Companies. Yeah, I mean, it, it 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 makes perfect sense. It's an area that I'm quite passionate about. Um, and then I'm um, re-question for you. So we've talked a little bit about how, you know, you guys, I guess actually we haven't really talked about it as much. How, so let me ask the question. Um, how have you guys incentivized building on Zillica platform? I, I read a little bit on the website about, you know, about um, about grants and things of that nature, a new fund that you guys are have spun up, I believe. Um, but if you don't mind sharing a little bit more oh, about sure. it, we'd love to know. So we, obviously when we started uh, Zillica, we had this uh, fund that we called the Ecosystem Fund. Uh, back then, it was about $5 million uh, in the early stages. And we used that to fund all sorts of things on Zilliqa, ranging from, let's say, wallets to explorers to SDKs to, mm -hmm. to general dApps. We also use that funds to actually invest in some of these projects that are building on Zilliqa. Mm -hmm. So Unstoppable Domains, for, for example, we gave them a grant, just like Ethereum Foundation gives grants to different projects. So we gave grants to projects. And eventually, that initial sort of a grant program sort of became much bigger and we started to call it Zillhive. 
um, you know, hive of Zill projects, which does now more things, you know, you know, more than just giving grants. So it also runs an incubation. So, you know, you could, mm -hmm. let's say you have just an idea and you want to run and make sure that this idea comes to a stage where you can actually go for a fundraise. So they help you incubate uh, your idea in that, in that program. They also teach you. So for example, if you are new to blockchains, you know, you can get language course, or you can get to learn about how to develop on a blockchain like Zilliqa. And they do all sorts of other, you know, things like, like grants, of course. So that's, that's one aspect, Zillahive. Um, then we also launched Zillica Capital, which invests in, you know, I would say again, seed level to A level and even beyond. So, uh, you know, if you are basically starting, you know, you could reach out to Zillica Capital and, you know, you, you get grants from there. Um, you know, or if you have already gotten a grant from Zillahive and you want to get a little bit more money to expand your team, again, Zillica Capital could be an option for you. We recently also launched a creators fund where the idea is to help. This is a very dedicated fund around NFT and metaverse. So the idea is to invest more in the NFT and metaverse sort of um, you know, domain. And so I would say there are three, at least three uh, sort of incentive program that people and developers can, can leverage. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then another question that's kind of, I guess an aside to that one, when when these teams are you know they're they're supplied with capital or Zill or or what have you from y'all's foundation or one of your ecosystem funds um, or they've built it themselves right and they have a project that's about to be live or is live how do you find that the teams who are building these DApps are incentivizing users to come over to the Zillica ecosystem? So one is obviously so uh, we try to encourage people to um, get in you know get the community involved as quickly as possible. It could be, for example, through initial launch offerings. So basically, you know, selling some of their tokens to, to uh, the community. And like it or not, you know, even though you know, you know, we can love and hate ICOs as you know, as much as we want. They're they're effective. But they're effective. They help they help bootstrap an initial set of uses for you. Mm -hmm. And after that, obviously, you know, Zilliqa helps you in terms of marketing. So of course, you know, let's say if you are starting, you may be starting with a group of I don't know, you know two team members and probably a community of thousand people. But Zillica has a much bigger and larger consumer base. So we also help you market your product in different ways. Uh, whether it be, you know, talking about, you know, testing your product sometimes. So I, sometimes I randomly go out and check on ViewBlock, which is our explorer, and see what's, who is building what and, and see if there's any, anything interesting coming up and then give feedback. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of this is basically organic. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think it's all about, you know, building the right tokenomics and building, making sure that your community is involved with what you're building and sees that they can, let's say, get a benefit of what you're building at some point. And I think if they are aligned with you, I think you will succeed. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and that is also you know, consistent with, I'd say, from what I've heard from you, at least, the thesis of Zillico in general, right? It's a, a scalable, capable blockchain that also provides reasonable, in fact, from what I've seen, extremely low gas fees that makes it a platform that people can actually use. Indeed, you know, it's true that, you know, um, I keep repeating this and I'll say this again, but uh, one thing that I've realized over the last, I think people are realizing as well, is that Ethereum itself, for example, even though it's the biggest sort of network out there, it has about 400 million addresses uh, that mm -hmm. has non-zero ether. Again, it's, let's, let, let's overestimate and say that, you know, this is, this is the number of users that Ethereum has. Okay. Um, or Ethereum holders. And now, if you look at the actual number of users who are using Ethereum on a daily basis, about 2 million. Mm. So from 400 million Ethereum addresses to about 2 million users. And again, these users are also addresses because it's very hard to know, you know sure, whether sure. one user has 5,000 addresses or just one address. Yeah. Which kind of gives a sense that, you know, we are so early in converting our token holders to users. Yes, ICOs were effective in bootstrapping that, but I think it kind of stops at the level of bootstrap. It bootstraps and then it it's kind of fades away. And again, the reason is where you know that we discussed earlier, you know, the user experience is bad. People are, you know, it's really tough and difficult for an average user to come, come and use some of these tabs. So I feel that you know there is there is a lot of room for you know, improvement from all angles to convert our token holders to users. You know, of course, people are trying to bring outside users to, to blockchains. What I feel is that you already have about 400 million users or holders to some extent, can we at least convert them into actual users? And that yeah. itself is a tough job at this point. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really interesting angle. And I think, you know, it's my, my initial reaction when I heard you saying that right off the bat was, well, you know, as we bring 
new dApps in different spaces that actually interact with other functions of people's lives, we'll see a lot more adoption, right? And I'm sure that's true. But then I kind of checked myself and I thought, well, we all interact with finances every single day, right? So, and and naturally, too, I think just the fact that so many blockchains are based off of token or projects are based off of tokenomic schedules that do result in some semblance of value, right? Like monetary value. It, it only stands to reason that DeFi was the first major application to find purchase with on blockchain technology. But it is still really interesting. And I know we're talking in rough numbers, but, you know, but two million, two over 400 is a, is a pretty, is a pretty wild percentage. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, indeed. You know, it, it, it yeah, just shows that, you know, we have not been, I mean, you know, people often say that, no, you know, Ethereum community is, is big, you know, I guess it's big. Mm -hmm. But what I also realized that there are a lot of people who hold Ether, but have never used a single dApp. Yeah, what I, mean, but I, many, I would, I would guess more than, more than half, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically, these are people who, and again, if you think about it, right? An average user today, an average user, an average token holder today holds about five to 10 assets. You know, you will hold BDC, you will hold ETH, you will hold probably USDT, USDC, and you'll hold probably five other speculative assets. Is it reasonable to ask this, this guy, this average user who holds about 20 tokens and expect him to use all those 20 dApps for which these tokens have? It's, it's not reasonable. Uh, one, because let's say, let's say you're just talking about staking, right? Which is the simplest thing for each protocol, right? So now you have to go to, let's say, Zilliqa's uh, staking portal. You have to get hold of Zilliqa's ledger app. Then you have to figure out how to stake. Then repl replicate the same thing with Polkadot. Then replicate the same thing with uh, Cosmos and do the same thing with something else. It's so painful. It's so painful for people to use some of these apps. And, and again, maybe the incentives are so strong that people are just not, you know, they, they keep buying tokens and not use them. So it's also, I think, a problem that we have to somehow figure out a better way of handling it. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, or the, you know, kind of the, the, the central, the cent what I should say, the CFI yield apps, right? You know, like the, those who, where you can go send your tokens and make three to 11% a year, right? It's, and for those of us who spend a lot of time in DeFi or with like on-chain activity, right? It's, it's almost laughable where I'm like, why would I go for 8% when I could go for 40%? or 60%, which as I know, you know, is still moderate compared to a lot of these pools. Mm -hmm. And I can appreciate that, right? Like somebody's thinking, okay, I'm more comfortable with 8% than I am with 3000%. That's reasonable, right? <laughs> but there's but there's a lot of room in between there for utilization. And, and I think you're spot on where, you know, the, the UX and UI of these centralized crypto apps is just a lot more intuitive for most people where they can go buy coin on a centralized exchange, send it to a yield, uh, you know, a yield aggregator, so to speak. And then they're, you know, they're involved in crypto, but they're hands off. You're done, you're done, indeed. And let's, let's say compare, even if you look at the tooling, right? I think we have been slow at developing those tools. So uh, if you look at, you know, there has been, I don't know, at least after Ethereum got launched, there was at least two or three competitors coming up after Ethereum, right? It took at least four or five years for projects to develop a, a cross-chain wallet, right? You mm -hmm. know, MetaMask only recently, started to support some of the EVM chains. Yeah. You know, um, XDeFi, I think it's uh, one of the cross-chain wallets that has come up. It was only recently. Until, until then, it was all about, you know, let's download one wallet for this chain, another wallet for this chain, another wallet for this chain, and you keep doing yeah. that. You know, you are, you are basically pushing your users away. And, and I think it, this industry has not done justice to its users. I mean, it, it, yeah, I agree. It, and it has also resulted in a lot of, a lot of lost resources Indeed. too. Indeed. I mean, when somebody, a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago was like, hey, I sent, uh, you know, I sent, I don't even know, like a couple thousand dollars worth of Ethereum to my Solana wallet. And I was like, never coming back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I was like, I'm sorry. And they're like, what do you mean? Like just a couple of days, right? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Like you probably will never see that again. <laughs> yeah, so there are, I think there are, there are work, there's work to be done, I think overall for the space to move forward. Again, I'm not surprised that, you know, it's slow. I think it's just, as I said, it's about 10 years old. I think it will take a bit of time, you know, consider the early yeah. internet, internet days. It, take, it took ages for us to get to Twitter. It took ages yeah. for us to get to Facebook. I think it will take, it will take a bit of time. One, for the technology to mature, uh, two, um, you know, for the users to, to come into that circle 
and feel comfortable putting their money into some of these projects. So, yeah, and money and money aside, I mean, for there to be enough use cases where it touches more aspects of people's lives, right? Like, I mean, when I think about when I think about the early days of the internet, or at least what I've been told or watched about the early days of the internet, right? Like, you know, some of the some of the initial websites were they were fun, but they were any real application on a day to day basis, right? Um, and then, obviously, as you know, as as, as as life continued trucking along and more application happened on the web, things that people originally said, well, nobody will ever go to a computer for that, right? Became totally commonplace. So I, I think we'll see something similar where it'll go from nobody will ever use a blockchain for that to everything. It's powered by, yeah, it's powered by blockchain and, and you yeah. won't even feel it. You know, it will, you know, we would like to see a day when many of these applications are powered by blockchains and you just don't, you know, you don't even feel the need to see and check what's, what's running behind the scenes today. Yeah. It's maybe it's also because of the investment angle, right? You know, people are also getting involved in blockchains for investments. And when they try to invest, they try to understand at least how the technology yeah. works. They try to understand how your consensus protocol works, but honestly, why, why should an average user be forced to learn about BFD and proof of work and POS yeah. and whatnot? Yeah. That was another, that was thing I saw on y'all's website that I think about all the time, you know, like, for instance, I recently my a couple of my family members asked me to give them a presentation on crypto and blockchain. And, and, and my mom was like, you know, we just really need to understand blockchain. And I was like, I'm happy to help you get there. But with all due respect, do you know how phones work? Yeah. Right? Like, do you know, do you know how the internet works? This is what I saw on, on y'all's website. It's like, does somebody actually know how the internet works? No, most people have absolutely no idea. And it's totally fine. Because yeah. the because the level of you know, the level of UX that's required to interact with things built on the internet has gotten to a point where you don't really have to understand how it functions. You just have to know how to interact with it. Indeed. Indeed. I mean, it's very much like saying, oh, look, here's my website and it's hosted on AWS. And let me explain you how AWS works. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. It's, I'm just trying to buy some, I mean, I'm just trying to buy some of your pottery from your website. I don't think I need to know how AWS functions. Exactly, exactly. So I think- <laughs> and By the way, uh, when you start your pottery website, make sure to send it to me. <laughs> Indeed. So I, I think this is this is where I think um, there's a lot of work to be done. And again, I'm, I'm not surprised that um, you know we only have two million users out there in the in the, yeah. in the, in the blockchain space. So I, it will take a bit, bit of time, but I'm confident that you know if you are not short sighted, if you are looking for the long term sort of goals of changing uh, the way we you know see money and the yeah. way we value money, I think I think you know that that day will come very soon. I totally agree with you. All right. Two, two final questions to wrap it out. The first is, um, what is what 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 do you guys have upcoming? Either a either a project that's building on Silica or something that you guys have at a foundation level. What what are you the most excited about? Let's say for the next you know next quarter, next six months. Yes, yeah, there's a lot of projects that we're planning on in the esports arena. So uh, we have been talking to quite a few esports companies, mm -hmm. and many of them will be launching uh, you know their tokens as well. Awesome. Um, integrations into metaverse and all sorts of things that you can imagine with balls and whistles. So you'd see a lot of a uh, lot of work around that uh, because when we feel that, as I said earlier, you know the esports crowd I feel is very close to the crypto crowd in terms of being digitally native and so on, and um, and so that's that's one angle. The second thing I think um, there is, you know, the, the social token being able to sort of commoditize in some way a community. I think it's very powerful. And it brings a lot of incentives for followers and people who are involved in that community. And I think, uh, you know, for some reason, I think the esports industry has not seen that uh, that incentive play out in some good way. So I think I'm looking forward to how that that comes about. Um, there's a similar projects coming up on you know, sort of, for example, tokenizing YouTubers. So for example, imagine yourself as a early stage YouTuber and you would like to tokenize yourself. So that at some point, whoever follows you, whoever shares your content, and whoever, whoever believes in you, gets uh, gets to get a benefit of what you may potentially earn at some point of time later. Later, when you become rich, famous, and with uh, five million followers and whatnot. Yeah. So there's a lot of work going on around building social tokens, uh, NFTs, and metaverse for sure. Around the DeFi space, we are uh, literally working on making our staking liquid. So today, um, when you stake your results, it gets basically gets stuck in that contract and log forever and until you decide to take your stake out. And what we're doing is we're trying to make that stake liquid in the sense that let's say you put 100 zil of stake and you would get, let's say 100 bonded zil, 
And then you can use that 100 bonded zil for something else. So it becomes more like your leverage tool that allows you to do yeah. it. Yeah, it's a, a, a collateral mechanism. Exactly. Yeah. I would say that these are two key areas that we're working on and hopefully we'll be able to share something interesting very soon on this. And by the way, since you're talking about website, we are launching a, a, a kind of revamped website very soon, probably to, tomorrow or the day after. So you'd see uh, more content, again, very user-focused fo content. So we're literally trying to attract people towards users towards uh, you know, using blockchains because we feel that yes, developers are important, but users are even more important. You know, when, when imagine for example, you're a developer and you see that here's a chain that has a million users, you'd be stupid not to go and build on that chain, right? No yeah. matter what your financial motive is, you'd, if, if you see that there's user, you would want to build, right? It's just like, you know, Android and iOS. You have Facebook applications running on both, you know, both platforms and why not? Because you know, you, Android has users, the same, same does iOS. So uh, I think if you can show to people that there are users there, there's no reason why developers won't build. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with you there. I think uh, I think when you guys can build a blockchain-based Android iOS bridge, that'll be that'll be the biggest thing there ever was. Indeed. <laughs> well, I think we have we have bridges today. Uh, yeah. You know, b between Ethereum, Zilliqa, Ethereum, and whatnot, right? I think the pain point still is that if you want to bridge your assets, you still have to pay the Ethereum fees, right? Yeah. So the, well, the first side, the one, one side, when you lock your assets. So the idea is, can we build a, a, this bridge that doesn't require bridge? You know, in, mm -hmm. in the sense that you don't have to move assets, you somehow you know, magically you know, be able to sell your Ethereum assets on Zilliqa chain in some way. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it might be a wishful thinking right now, but I feel that you know, we have to build bridges which are slightly more efficient than they are today. You know, today's bridges, you know, bridges are very, very lame, you know, very simplistic. I think we have to go slightly more advanced so that, you know, users don't have to pay too many, too much fees on one side. Yeah. And I mean, that is, um, that is all that I had for you today. Is there, is there anything else that you'd like to make sure the, the listeners hear out of this? Well, uh, well, we have, we have Valkyrie and Zilliqa uh, Trust there. So if you are listening to Valkyrie Zilliqa Trust, go and, uh, uh, check out Zal, you know, Valkyrie Zilka Trust there. We also, uh, as I said, you know, we are launching our website, which is uh, a revamped version of what you may have seen, James. So check out that. And then we are also super active on social media, Twitter or Telegram and whatnot. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, thoughts, ideas, suggestions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we are very open to taking ideas. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. This was really fun. My pleasure, James. Thanks for joining us today. If you want to learn more about something in the crypto sphere, please reach out to us at lightbulb at valkyrieinvest.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. Disclosures. The opinions presented herein are solely of the individual and not necessarily representative of Valkyrie Investments, Inc. and their affiliates. There is no guarantee that any specific outcome will be achieved. Investments may be speculative, illiquid, and there is a risk of total loss of your investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.